Your dad, isn't he? Yeah. We appreciate you, buddy. They're not quite, before they start, they're not quite actually started. We are blessed. Yes, we are. So we are welcome to get to know Jesus. We are in Lesson 49, which is on pages 103 through 115 in your book. The Bible text is on pages 104 through 107. Got a little extra text in there tonight. Uh, oh, really? Uh, that's not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> fun of having laptops so think they can do things behind your with, behind your back. Um, our lesson text is on lecture notes or page 108 to 113. And Jesus is teaching by parables. And so tonight we're going to talk about how to build a productive life with God. And here's our little timeline. So how to build a productive life with God. Have you ever had a vegetable or a flower garden? Isn't it amazing to watch a seed germinate and grow into a plant and bear fruit to eat or flowers to enjoy? Some of the best food I've ever had has been grown in my own backyard. If you've had a garden, you know what that's about. Uh, of course, I, I probably had to dig more bugs out of it but, <laughs> than the grocery store does, but it's yeah. good stuff. Yeah, you got uh, We're in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, and Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. Jesus teaches the apostles how to apply the lesson that we talked about in lesson 28. So, preparing to teach. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, and Mark 4, verse 1, and Luke 8, verse 4. Where's my... Oh, I left my pointer device in there. Hang on, we spare It's in some minor technical difficulties. There's a reason why I did that. There. Okay, that same day, Jesus began, went out of the house, began to teach by the lake, so large crowds were gathered around him. The crowd was so large, Mark says... People were coming to Jesus from town after town, Luke says, that he got into a boat and he sat out in the, on a lake with all the people, while all the people stood on the shore at the water's edge, and he told them, he taught them the many things in parables. And in his teaching he said, well we're going to get on to what he said here in just a little bit. We're up here around Capernaum. On the Sea of Galilee, a little bigger picture showing you the whole area. Actually, it's the city of Nahum, the prophet. Capernaum is the city of Nahum. The city of Nahum. Okay. Uh, another little tidbit. This lake actually has three, if not four names. Let's see. A lake Chinnereth, Lake Gennesaret, uh, Sea of Capernaum. I think there sea might be sea one. Galilee. Dead Sea, isn't it? No, no. Dead, Dead Sea is way below. down below yeah. here. Yeah. That's another place. And it's a very big lake. <coughs> so is this one very much like the Dead Sea? A lot of salt? No, no, no. No, no, no. It's fresh uh, water. It's balanced. Black water. Great Lakes. Perch and... Good fish. Yeah. Black water. Great Lakes. I also have yeah. fresh water yeah. fish. I've seen movies about that where they catch a lot of good fresh water fish. Well, how to build a productive water. life with God. Number one, prepare to teach. Uh, choose an environment that is conductive to communication and learning. You notice that that's what Jesus did here. And uh, he uh, went, first of all, to where people were. And, of course, Jesus, by this time, this is his height of his ministry. Popularity, people are coming from town to town just to hear him speak. You know, we get somebody uh, that's uh, well-known in, in Christian circles. And if he comes to Tampa or Orlando, some of us will drive over there just to hear this person speak. And if he comes to Lakeland, that's all the better. We don't have to drive as far. But we, we, they have a, a re reputation, a respect, they're known, and we like to hear what they have to say. Well, this is what Jesus was doing. So uh, you want to get an environment that's conducive to communication. <clears throat> Where Jesus was standing there on the beach or in the town, wherever, people could hear him oh, back maybe this far, but those back a little further have trouble hearing him. If you've noticed why, one of the reasons why a lot of speakers are up on a podium because that way the sound could travel to the back of the room and everybody in between can hear. But if the teacher's got a lot of people right here in front of them, they kind of block all the sound and those in the back have trouble hearing. Well, it's kind of a similar situation here. Another thing you want to do in preparing to teach is choose a teaching style. 
And we're going to find out here, actually through the next several lessons, that Jesus used a lot of parables. Uh, it, it, just, it just really helps to drive the lesson home. If you can find something here that the people are familiar with, that they can identify with, how many times have you used an illustration to try to win an argument? Uh, I mean, uh, to discuss something with somebody. Uh, parables work real good for things like that. Another thing you want to do is some uh, good seed, same soil, different results. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, uh, uh, verse, uh, chapter 13, the last part of verse 3 through verse 9. Mark 4, verses 3 through 9, and Luke 8, verses 5 through 8. Listen, Jesus says, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and it was trampled on. The birds of the air came and ate it up. Some fell in the rocky places, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly. And it came up, and the plants withered because they had no moisture, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up around with it. They choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it came up and grew and produced a crop, uh, yielded a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. More, 30 or 60 times what was sown. And Jesus saw this. He called out, He who has ears, let him hear. So there's something in there for us to listen to. Let's see if we can get a little closer to it. So I said, good seed, same soil, different results. The farmer sows the same seed in four different locations. The soil is the same also. But there are other factors that determine the effectiveness of the seed's productivity. Uh, the, the first soil is on the path. It's just like, I'm not going to listen to this message at all. You go to some people, you try to talk to them about spiritual things, and they just don't want to talk to you. They don't want to listen to you. Don't give me that religion stuff, and uh, don't waste your time with them. Walk away. Other people, you'll go and talk to them, and, and they'll say, wow, that's good stuff. Yes, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but they've got one foot in the church and, and one foot in the world. That's on the fence, right? No, they're on the fence. And uh, before they can get really firmly planted in the church, they're lost back in the world, choked out by the weeds. Another gets on the, uh, what was the third Rock, soil? Rocky. The rocky soil. And they're just too much in the world. And even though they say that Christians, they're over here on the rocks and they just can't get any good root. They don't read the Bible. They don't go to church. They just say, well, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and I'm saved. And we'll let God determine that or not. But you see different, same soil, same seeds, different results. Some got themselves on some good fertile soil, they sown some roots, they read their Bible, go to church, they grow as a Christian, and they produce a good crop. So, how to teach effectively. Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, Mark 4, 10 through 12, Luke 8, 9 and 10. When he was alone with the disciples, Jesus, the twelve and the others, said, they came to him and asked him, Why do you speak into these parables? And he wanted to know what this parable meant. He replied, The knowledge of the secret of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, same place, by the way. Ah, how about that? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same place. Has been given to you, but not to them. Those on the outside, or others, whoever has been given, more will, and he will have it, Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That sounds like the federal government. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't the word Gentile fit in there somewhere? Uh, not yet, but not we yet. might get there somewhere in the process. Why? This is why I speak to them in parables. So that they, though seeing, they may be ever seen, but not perceiving. Though hearing, ever hearing, they may not, they do not hear. They do not understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. That is scary. Um, for this people's heart has become callous. They have heard with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and their ears and understand with their hearts and turn. And I would heal them and be forgiven. 
But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Referencing back to those in the Old Testament. So how to teach effectively? Uh, the apostles asked Jesus why it is that he teaches in parables. There are some things that God wants us to figure out for ourselves. There are some things that he simply wants us to believe in him and trust him for the details. I've noticed as I've gone through my life, a lot of things God reveals to us on a need-to-know basis. He doesn't tell you when you're going to get sick or what you're going to get sick of. He doesn't tell you when you're going to die. Aren't you kind of glad? So that 73 doesn't mean nothing. That 73 doesn't mean Thank nothing. Thank God. The other night I had a 73, 73. I was sleeping. I never had nothing. That's like that. the number on the lottery ticket that's going to win you. Thank <laughs> God. Oh, wait, Jim. If you don't buy I'm the lottery ticket. I'm not going to tell this week. Maybe next week. not 73, though. No, no, no. no. Uh, I'll say that's 50. Close well, yeah. enough. Yeah. You got lots. So, hey, Grant, yes. PS some good soil. Do what? He has some good soil comment here. Good soil. Uh, this this guy was doing an experiment and he was putting worms. He put worm in some good soil. He put a worm in some whiskey. Put some worm in some tobacco. <laughs> soil. He put another worm in chocolate. This means well, well the worm nervous. and the chocolate died. The worm and the tobacco <laughs> smoke died. The worm and the whiskey died. The worm and this fresh good soil was just thriving and grinning from worm 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 grin to worm grin. And you know what the moral of this story is? Yeah. And a lady in the church says, yes, if you if you drink whiskey and if you <laughs> smoke cigarettes, if you eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. That's okay. Oh, that was good. That's, that's good. from Preacher Don down there. Man, Preacher. it's been 107 years before I heard that one. You told me when you are up in Wisconsin. But and, and well, we're going to go on here. <laughs> And we're, we're going to work on applying the lesson. Now, we've taught the lesson effectively. We've learned that if you drink and smoke and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. That's right. <laughs> that's a teaching style. All right. That's a teaching style. So we're going to apply the lesson. What does that mean? Matthew chapter 13, verses 8 to 23, Mark 4, 13 to 20, Luke 8, 11 to 15. Jesus said to them, Did you understand? don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Listen to what the parable of the sower means. The seed is the word of God. <coughs> the farmer sows the word. Some people are uh, the people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. And anyone who hears the message about it, the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one, Satan, comes along. The devil comes along, snatches him away, takes the word that that uh, away the word that was from their hearts, sown in their hearts, and this seed sown along the path. Oh, we'll get the rest of that later too. Well, see, the hard ground is like a person who refuses to go to church, read their Bible, this devotion, uh, read this devotion, or be around Christians because they don't want to be a Christian. There are some people who absolutely do not want to be Christians. And I find that so hard to understand. But even when Jesus was alive on this earth, with the power of words that he had, there were still those people who adamantly, Absolutely, oh. so rejected him that they killed him. The Pharisees, right? Pharisees. Yes, oh. yes they're not Pharisees. Well, I'm not at her. Any of that little Jewish girl, man, she <laughs> will not do what Jesus did. I think Jesus remember I told you. Yeah. Same thing nowadays. The Sadducees were against him also. So oh, Jesus. they are hard, and they can't. The seed just can't sink any roots in and push up a crop to benefit anyone else. Now, maybe they had a bad experience and said uh, in, in a church when they were younger. Or maybe they heard the bad things said about Christians and have never known somebody who was a Christian who could help them see the fruit that Jesus produces in us. You know, for we're living the fruit of the Spirit, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That is nothing but a description of the character of Jesus. Right there is the main one, I think, right there for all Christians when you just shared that last one. Well, if they've never heard the gospel, but you know, you, some people you can share the gospel with them and they're still not going to listen. Yeah. Especially if they're steeped in another religion, they may be, uh, may be hard to get them to listen. But we'll... Uh, to hear it thoroughly. Hear the gospel thoroughly. Uh, they have to be open-minded. 
And get them open-minded, you have to get them to trust you and respect you as a friend. And probably about the best way to do that is just to be a friend. Don't try to convert them. Don't try to cram it down their throats. Just love on them until they finally start to listen to some of the things you say. The Jordan? thing we got going for us that Jesus had going for him is he raised the dead. Well, Jesus, Nobody else raised we could quickly ascertain no. that Christianity has is far superior to any other religion on earth. And primarily because Jesus himself yeah, raised from the dead. Yes. But yes, he raised others from the dead, which no one else has done either. Yeah. But the bottom line is don't waste time on that person. Just go look for better soil. Mm -hmm. Now, applying the lesson part two, the one who received the word, others like the seed sown in the rocky places, is like the man, hears the word, and at once receives it with joy. He became a Christian. But since he has no root, and they only last a short time, and when trouble and persecution comes, times of testing, because of the sword or the, of the word, he quickly falls away. Let me say something. We hear it with joy. We also live and serve in joy. I never well, thought I this thoroughly so. taught before. But see, how many people have you known? And I'm sure that if you've been around Christians at all, and you've been around the church at all, you've seen people who came in and fell out. And uh, just never took root. Rocky ground is the one who accepts Jesus but doesn't grow. They seldom go to church. They don't read their Bible, pray, or worship, or, or give. Uh, they have it in their heads a little, but it's nowhere really honestly in their hearts. They're so busy with their work. They're so busy with their hobbies. So busy watching sports. They're so busy doing everything else. They don't have time for God. Do you know anybody like that? Everybody say yes. Yes. Oh, there, I got you that time. They may claim to believe in Jesus, but they're not producing Christian fruit yeah. and will soon be totally back in the world. Because aren't we constantly fighting a battle between the world mm -hmm. and, and our faith in right. Christ? Sure. And even those of us who have become more mature Christians, we've been a Christian a long time, and, and we're pretty solid grounded, we're still vulnerable, are we not? Yeah, we are still vulnerable. As long as we're alive on this earth. Yeah. It scares me sometimes. That's the most connective word there is to love. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. It keeps you on your toes. If you love Jesus, it will keep you on your toes. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't be there. Maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Oh, I better change that thought pattern into something more wholesome real fast. Because I don't want to go down this road any further. Now, we're fighting that battle. Some people don't fight it. Oh, I like my hobbies. I like my job. I'm a workaholic or whatever. And they, they just let that take them away from God. They may claim to believe in Jesus, but they're not producing any Christian fruit. And we'll soon be totally back in the world. Now, you might try to help them remove some of the rocks in their soil. So Jesus can root and grow. And sometimes you'll succeed. And helping somebody realize that what they're doing is not godly or, or not producing Christian fruit. And sometimes you'll just be like jerking the weed out of the rocks or the, the plant out of the rocks. It didn't have any soil anyhow. And, and uh, expediting what they're doing to themselves. Here's another application of the lesson. Uh, one who received the soil that fell among the thorns is like the one who hears... The word, but as they go on their way, they're choked. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in, other pleasures come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful, and they do not mature. So ground with weeds is the one who accepts Jesus, but they are still worldly. While they're going to church, they're still watching shows on television that dishonor God, marriage, and the family. Are there any shows like that on TV? Huh. Yes. Can you find any shows not. like that uh, on TV that yeah. aren't like right. that? There you go. Very few. Very few. There are some. But uh, way too many of them have gotten away from honoring God. And, and uh, that's a part of our challenge as Christians is, number one, not to watch those kinds of shows. Number two, to support shows that do honor Christ. Or do something else besides watch TV. What in the world did we do before we had televisions? Played a lot of family games. We sat out on our Read front porch and talked to the neighbors as they walked by. 
Or we went by and talked to our neighbor. What did we do before we had radio? We went next door, we went down the street and said, Hi, how are you guys doing? Or we uh, invited George and Alice over for, for a game, a cup of lemonade or tea, and, and uh, we'd chat or we'd play a, a, a game or something. We enjoyed each other. Nowadays, I don't know, my neighbor's good, and so I'm too busy watching TV to go out and get acquainted. So many people, we know our neighbors, but that's not... Too many people don't know their neighbors. Yeah. Some people are looking at pornography or having sex outside of marriage or going to parties and getting drunk and using oh, drugs, geez. breaking the law, etc. Some of the pursuits of this world will choke what little influence <clears throat> the church is having on them and they will likewise be lost. Have you known anybody that was always in church on Sunday but back in the world on Monday? Mm -hmm. Like... The love <laughs> That's right. You I got that way. That. I was that way. The one person that Sylvia yeah, worked with for a while, bragged about going to church, but having an affair with some guy on mm. Saturday night. So you come back Monday morning and say, "Who? Guess what I did Saturday night?" And, she was and yet she church. claimed to be a good Christian. And she was so. in church on Sunday. Sandy, <laughs> no, you no. build porches, don't you? Mm. Then they go to confession yeah, on Saturday. Well, there she wasn't was a Catholic. <laughs> What's that? Oh, she was a we'll kill porches and air conditioning. Yeah, that probably is. Strong Christian. Yeah, right. Air conditioning. So, thing in the church. The problem is, assume the pursuits of this world will choke out what little influence the church is having on them, and they likewise are, are lost. They will give in to peer pressure and temporary pressures of the world without thinking about what kind of fruit they can be producing for God. And if you try to say, well, what you're doing is wrong, they'll say, huh? Get with it. The world is different now. We got to be like the world today, you know. We got to get. We got to be hip, or we will not be. We'll be old and old-fashioned and square and stuff like that. Yeah, remember my friend saying when I when I um, said something to her, she said, "Sylvia, this is the '90s." <laughs> I say God's word is forever, yesterday, today, and forever. His yeah. Word. yeah. Yeah, if we weren't engaged in all this sexual nice. immorality of all kinds of types of ways and shapes and forms, we would not have yeah. near the problems right. in our society exactly. and in our churches that we are having today. So she got a 1990s so, STD. <laughs> I know, really. Well, you know, remember years ago we were talking about this the other day that I remember we never had any gals in school that were pregnant. But I remember my mom said years ago that if you didn't see the gal for a while, she went up to visit an aunt and uncle and came back, you know, off the farm. But, yeah. but nowadays they pay for all these young kids. Well, the sexual revolution of the 60s, and now the mentality is if you're not having sex, you better go get some enhancement pill and go find somebody. Yeah, Who cares the, whether it's your wife or not? They had the doctrine sex before eight or it's too late. Good. Yeah. You ever heard that? But... That's but they're in, um, well, they stay in school, they get pregnant, they, they don't have to make that you know, a status symbol. Like they get pregnant, so that's a status symbol. Yeah. Uh, you get pregnant through three different men school. and have babies through three Years different men, you get three different child support checks from three different incomes, and you got it made. Oh yeah, it's not a bad thing. It's not about God, it's about the people that are in the church. And then if you get a sexually transmitted disease, you say, oh cool, woe is me, woe is me, please fix me. I got this problem because I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing. Well, your best hope for the person like that is to get them to pull the weeds up and get rid of them so Jesus can have the nourishment he needs to change their lives and produce godly food. Again, it depends on having a relationship with that person, uh, uh, a friendship with that person where even though they haven't matured to your level, they respect you and they will listen to you. If they won't listen to you, you know not going to have any effect. So friendship, you know, it takes so much time to build a friendship with a person. Sometimes I'm a little too impatient. You got a problem here, I want to nail the problem and cut to the chase and go on. I got other things to do besides sit around and wait for you to decide you like me enough to listen to me. Uh, so <laughs> I've got a battle there to fight. But we do build friendships and hopefully we do have some friendships with people that aren't already Christians. Uh, we still try to engage people and, and look for people that aren't going to church and, and find a way to build a relationship that we can hopefully influence them for Christ. That's part of our goal. Now, the good soil, the one that received the seed that fell on the good soil is like those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, understand it, they accept it, they retain it, 
and they persevere and they produce a crop yielding a 30, 60, 30, or even a hundredfold what was sown. You know, let me add that noble part there. I got a noble heart. Yeah. There's also a Bible verse that says not many noble are called. So, I mean, this is very interesting. Is noble? Well, I want to be noble. I guess if you're already noble, you're already in the calling and you can't be called because you're there already or something. I want to have a good heart. Good soil has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are seeking to learn more about Jesus. We worship. We pray. We give to others. You know, if you love God, the, the offering plate coming around is, is an act of worship. It's a privilege, not a problem. People that have a problem giving to God don't love God or have a problem with their love of God. And if they love their money more than they love God, now, of course, you can't give all of your money to God. Uh, you've got to have something to live on. You've got to find that balance. But there's a lot of people that can give a lot more than they are willing to because their maturity, their love for God hasn't matured to that level yet. We'll just work with them, worship and pray with them, and hopefully they'll grow in that, that aspect of their relationship. And we've got the hope of heaven. Mature soil, uh, seed on good soil has a hope of heaven with all those who are uh, uh, Christians. We are active in our relationship with Jesus and we want to nourish that relationship so it will bear much fruit for His kingdom. Now, Christians are... The word religious has kind of taken on a negative connotation today. It's really not a negative word. If you get back to the root of it, it's a, a relationship with God. But sometimes we get religion defined as all those little religious acts we do. I went to church, I put my money in the offering, I prayed like a, a pious person. And, and it's not really in here. But real religion is in here. And it is a good thing. But in this context, we're using it in the world's context. Uh, we're not religious or in your face to other people. Uh, sometimes getting in your face to other people. Now if you've got the personality to do it, Go with it. Yeah. I have seen people that have the personality to get in your face and you can love them for it. <laughs> even though you hate them for doing it. <laughs> the Bible, oh. the Bible That's gives, when they're a lot of work. <laughs> the Bible gives the definition for religion. Real religion, yeah, really. undefiled before God, is to visit the sick and the homeless. Right. And to keep oneself spotless in the world. Wow, that keep last one's part. self spotless in the yeah, world. That was a power statement. That was a power. That was the. That's the oh, hardest part. I mean, visiting the homeless and the sick. And we yeah. can do that. And the one you said before, we have good religions in here. That's another power statement. I'm going well, up off this chair a little more every time. If you're keeping yourself spotless from the world, that means you're recognizing okay. temptation, and you're saying, because I love Jesus, I don't want to succumb to that temptation, and so you turn away from that temptation, and you just don't go there. Right. That's what that amounts to. Uh, those people are in an active relationship with Jesus. They are practicing, we are practicing what we believe. Uh, we're not secretive about our faith in God either. Religious pe people that have a pure, godly religion are not secretive about it, but they're not in your face. They can be friendly, they can show you by how they live and how they talk. Think about what words you use, especially if you're being stressed or you get um, a little bit of a shocking experience, <gasps> something happened, and how many times do you use the name of Jesus or God in a way that dishonors God, or have you found some other word to substitute for that? Too many Christians will run out Jesus as it's a byword. Christians. That bothers me. I don't know if it bothers you yet or not, but I hope it does. But just something to think about. Well, here is some good soil. Look at this crop of wheat. This crop of wheat was in Israel somewhere. I can't tell you where. But see, it looks like pretty healthy wheat. And it also, you notice, that wheat is ripe and ready for the harvest. Glenn, how many uh, ears of corn are you going to stock of corn? Uh, from my experience, about three, maybe four. Somebody told me one, but I, I was thinking seeing about three. Or Might four. depend on the type of corn, but uh, yeah. the corn I grew out in our place uh, in Cedar four Hills, years. I was getting three to four years off of each stalk of corn. Nature wouldn't allow it to hold up, I suppose, if it got to be eight or ten. 
backwards. Uh, <laughs> First right drop of wind. A good wind. We got a crack on the ground. Four was too many. Well, our conclusion is that the word of God is a seed, and you are the soil. What are you going to do with yourself to help that seed to grow or die? Are you going to help the seed in your life to grow or die? Are you going to be the soil that is packed hard and resistant to anyone telling you anything new, different, or better? Are you going to be engaging in sinful activities that compete for the nourishment that the soil needs before it can get enough roots to grow? Are you still looking at pornography, sitcoms on television, or spending time gambling, or going to bars and parties where ungodly things go on? Are you going to clutter your soil with obstacles that will hinder your seed from growing? Are things like a job, a hobby, friends more important to you than your relationship with God? Or are you going to let the rid, get rid of the rocks, loosen up your soil, remove the weeds, so God's seed can take root and produce His fruit right. in you? you put preaching on the metal there. Yes. <laughs> it's your choice. <laughs> You can choose. I wish I could control you. I'm having enough challenge controlling myself. Did you say going to meddling? Yeah. That was cool. I heard some preachers say that once in a while. So you probably got a call in your church. You got that. He's been there. Oh, cool. Jesus is a seed. You are the soil. And you have the freedom to choose what kind of life you are going to produce for God. Well, next week, Jesus is going to teach us something about gardening a little more. It's a parable. It has some very strong lessons for us to live by. And so we'll look at that next week. And now it's time to go to our discussion questions over on page 114 in our book. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.